Okay, let's talk a little bit about the physiology of breathing, of ventilation, and of movement of air. We'll definitely explore this in greater depth when we get to the respiratory system um, a little bit later in course. But for now, what I want you to do is have some understanding of uh, the basics, of the mechanics of this process, so that you can see how you impact it, uh, either positively or negatively, when you uh, artificially ventilate somebody. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the process of ventilation, what controls ventilatory rate, and then let's talk about how oxygen gets from out, outside of us to inside the bloodstream, and let's, let's, uh, let's look at those things uh, in depth. Okay, so uh, as you know, uh, we talked a little bit about the lungs as being the recipients of the air that comes in and out. What we haven't mentioned yet is that the diaphragm is the important control here. So I want you to think about um, the chest as having a couple different layers and they're all responsible for uh, moving air in and out. So when we talk about pressures, I want you to think about the respiratory system um, from the intrapulmonary pressure system and from inside the lung systems when you just sit there at rest and no air is moving in or out, the pressure inside your lung is exactly the same as atmospheric pressure in which you reside. So if the pressure is 14.7 psi, when you're at rest and you're not breathing in or out, the pressure inside your lung, the intrapulmonary pressure, also 14.7 psi. So how exactly is it that we get air to come into our lungs? Well, it makes sense that if I were to take the pressure, the intrapulmonary pressure, and I were to drop it, so if I lower the intrapulmonary pressure, then the pressure outside the lungs, out here in the air, exceeds the pressure that lies within those lungs, and as a result, air passively comes into the lung system. So your diaphragm is what allows you to do that. Your lungs are essentially bound on all their borders to the chest cavity. And they're bound, I'll use that term loosely because they're not anchored there, but the, the, the lining of your, the outside lining of the lungs makes a contact with the inside lining of your chest cavity and there's a little bit of fluid that lives there. And that's the area where there's negative pressure. So in between the lung tissue itself and the chest wall itself, there are these two shiny, glossy, very uh, smooth surfaces. They're called the pleura, the parietal and visceral pleurum. And the pleura are res responsible for, um, for providing an anchor point. They don't stick to one another, but it's a negative pressure that exists there because of fluid that exists there. Think about uh, taking two glass slides. If you take two glass slides and you drop a little drop of fluid in between them, if you put those two glass slides together and then you try to pull them apart, the fact that there's fluid in between them prevents them from coming apart. And there's more physics and chemistry that's associated with that. But for the time being, that's what I want you to think of. Think about those two glass slides. Think about a glass slide that lines the outside of your lungs and think about glass slides that line the inside of your chest cavity. And there's a little bit of fluid there. And when that fluid, when those two membranes come together, that fluid creates a negative pressure space which forces the lungs to remain open. So at that point, when the diaphragm contracts, the diaphragm contracts and it pulls downward. When it pulls downward, it essentially creates a negative intrapulmonary pressure. Negative intrapulmonary pressure means that atmospheric pressure is greater than the pressure that's inside the lungs, so air for uh, air is drawn into the lung system. And you can see that by way of this little bell jar and this, uh, this little cartoon that's representative of a lung model. And essentially what you have here, the pink is the lung and the little, uh, little flesh looking thing here that the person is pulling down on is essentially the diaphragm. This is otherwise a closed system so there's no air coming in or out other than through this little pipette and into the balloon. So when the diaphragm contracts, it pulls down, it creates a negative pressure inside the lung and inside the area around the lung, and atmospheric pressure then pushes air into our lungs. When we stop doing that, when our diaphragm relaxes, it pushes back up, as you can see that, it relaxes in the upward position, and when it does so, it creates a greater intrapulmonary pressure, 
than that of the pressure in the atmosphere around us, and that forces air out of our lung system. And generally, when we're at rest doing that, we have, we have very little notion that that's all happening. There's a lot of stuff happening, but we don't really pay attention to it because we're not aware of all those pieces. Now, take, for example, the patient who has asthma or who has emphysema, and you'll notice that when those guys are breathing, they have a lot of accessory muscle use. You'll see a lot of the intercostals, the scalenes, uh, they'll be positioned in a tripod position to better facilitate movement of air. And the reason for that, and the reason that they get all that musculature, is because passive exhalation by way of relaxation of the diaphragm is no longer an option for these guys because they cannot get air out of their lungs. They have either a restrictive or an obstructive disease that prevents them from breathing out. So in, in those patients, we have a buildup of muscle in the chest cavity, and that chest cavity then becomes a little bit of a different shape. If you look at the chest cavity of those patients, it's a little bit more barrel, it's a little bit more rounded. The anterior-posterior distance is increased, and the reason for that is because that's a more efficient way of getting air in and out. It's a compensatory mechanism for moving air outward. It allows the chest to squeeze more on that uh, pulmonary system and get air out. All right, so important thing to consider here. Um, what happens when you take a bag valve mask or an endotracheal tube and you place it inside the patient's trachea, which is represented by this little uh, glass pipette here? So now I want you to think about the physiology or the mechanics of breathing in that patient. Whereas before, when the diaphragm contracts, we have a negative intrapulmonary pressure negative intrapulmonary pressures promote movement of venous blood back into the chest back towards the right side of the heart it also creates a negative pressure in the chest where the body says hey there's a negative pressure so i'm going to do some things to compensate for that now take the patient that's intubated or that's being mechanically ventilated you are Im you are immediately changing and opposing the normal physiology of the human being because instead of creating a negative pressure in the pulmonary system, now when you force air mechanically or by way of bag valve mask into the lungs, now you've created a positive pressure system intrapulmonary, which is going to cause us some problems. So if you think about the mechanisms that we have to control blood pressure, you'll remember that in the carotid arteries and in the aorta and even in the lungs and in the heart, we have stretch receptors those things are designed to prevent overinflation. They're designed to prevent uh, a, a, a significant surge in blood pressure that could be harmful to the human body. So in this case, when we force air into the lungs, we are creating a positive pressure in the thoracic cavity, which then stimulates all of those carotid and aortic arch receptors that then transmit a message to the brain and say, hey brain, way too much pressure in here. What do you think the response of the brain is? The response of the brain is to tell the body to do a couple things to slow down. For example, the brain says, hey, if there's too much pressure, one of the things I can do is cause bradycardia. And if I make the heart rate decrease, that will decrease cardiac output. And as a result, I'll get a decrease in blood pressure. So think about this in the, uh, from the perspective of a cardiac arrest patient or a patient that's already hypotensive and or bradycardic because they're sick, they're in shock, Think about this patient now that gets electively uh, mechanically ventilated. So now you're going to take a bag valve mask and you're going to force air into them. You are reversing their physiology. You are worsening their hypotension. You are worsening their bradycardia. So think about that. Think about the physiology. Normal physiology relies on a negative intrapulmonary pressure in order to passively draw air into the lungs. In other words, pressure from outside is pushing Whereas when you take air and you force it in with a, with a bag or some other sort of device, we are reversing the physiology of that person. We are actually decreasing venous return back to the right side of the heart. We are decreasing blood pressure and we are promoting vagal stimulation and thereby uh, creating a bradycardic or a further bradycardic situation. So this is not to be taken lightly. The, the, the decision to mechanically ventilate a patient is very, very serious and should be done with the utmost care. All right, so let's take a little bit more uh, closer look of control. I don't want you to worry about all these pieces. We will evaluate these a little bit um, in more depth when we get to, to the right place.
What I want you to appreciate is that this is a complex system. I want you to appreciate that the pons and the medulla are the two primary areas of the brainstem that control respirations, even though they do have some external input from, uh, from other areas of the brain. For example, if I told you right now, take a deep breath in, um, the reason that you're able to do that is because there is voluntarily, you're able to voluntarily control and send a message to the pons to do that and, so, and to cause the diaphragm to contract. So I want you to be aware of those things, but I also want you to remember that the pons and the medulla, these have the absolute most basic instincts of respiration and respiratory drive. So anytime we have a problem in this area, we're also going to impact the respiratory drive and the rate of respiration. And that could be a, an increase or a decrease in the rate. And we'll look at that in depth at a later time. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about the, the concept of oxygenation. So the fact that you're moving air in and out of the patient's lungs is going to be really, really important. And in that air, we have to make sure that we have sufficient oxygen so that we can create an oxygen gradient. Remember that the way oxygen moves at the terminal levels in the alveolar area is simply by diffusion. There is absolutely no physical movement of air at the alveolar level. The only thing that exists down there is diffusion. So it is, if you have a high concentration of oxygen in the alveolar space, then you're going to have a greater concentration of oxygen uh, on this side of the fence than you do in the intravascular or the intracapillary area that surrounds that piece of alveolar tissue. And as a result, uh, as is the case with anything, uh, molecules move down their concentration gradients, meaning from the area of greatest concentration towards the area of lesser concentration. So your goal here is not only to be able to move air in and out, you're going to ventilate the patient when we, when we manage the airway. The other goal here is that we need to ventilate the patient with oxygen. We need to make sure that we create an oxygen gradient so that we can actually ensure oxygen movement across this alveolar capillary membrane and into the intracapillary or intravascular space. So after you get air movement um, all the way down to the trachea and the very, very small bronchioles, eventually there's just this concentration gradient that exists of oxygen and that oxygen then travels to the alveolar space where it crosses through this very thin alveolar membrane and it ends up crossing into the capillary space. This is the alveolar capillary membrane and therefore uh, red blood cells are available to pick up this oxygen and that's how we transmit it and transport it throughout the rest of the body. Now you'll see this purple arrow at the bottom, exactly the opposite happens with our waste product of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is also transported in the blood. It gets to the alveolar capillary membrane where there is a great oxygen gradient in the direction of the alveolar space, meaning that high oxygen, uh, I'm sorry, high uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the blood, low carbon dioxide concentration inside the alveolar space, therefore uh, CO2 travels into the alveolar space. So this is going to play a role in a little while because ventilation is going to be important to get rid of CO2. Ventilation is also going to allow us to measure CO2. So when we put end tidal CO2 detectors on a patient, we're actually trying to measure how much CO2 is coming from the bloodstream and into the alveolar space and then coming out through uh, the trachea and out of the mouth or the nose so that we can measure that and we can actually predict whether or not aerobic metabolism is happening in the distal parts of the body. So that's going to also give us some some uh, some ability to predict certain things as well. All right, so these are the concepts of respiration and ventilation, and we'll explore those more when we get to the respiratory system, but I wanted to provide you with that brief overview. You can also go to YouTube if you want to look at uh, some more information about um, uh, movement and the mechanics of breathing. Type in mechanics or physiology of breathing, and you'll see there are a ton of different things, uh, a lot of homemade little devices, these little bell jars and balloons but you'll be able to see that. You can even make it for yourself so that you can better grasp the concept of uh, the mechanics of breathing, which are really important. Again, we'll review the mechanics of breathing when we get to the chest trauma areas and respiratory system issues because you'll see that if you, uh, if you puncture a hole in any of those wrong places, you'll see that we lose the uh, contact between the uh, membrane that lines the lungs and the membrane that lines the chest. And when we do that, we call that pneumothorax when air or when fluid gets in there. We'll talk a little bit more about those conditions. All right, so stay tuned for that, and uh, I'll see you soon.